all about him. Let's give him worship this evening. Jesus, we bless your name. This whole service is about you. Our whole lives are centered around you. We ask that you be lifted up this evening. We give praise and glory to you. Increase your great name. In Jesus' name. Amen. The words of that song are so beautiful. If I decrease, he increases. Fill me with your glory. It's not something we're having to beg him to do, brothers and sisters. He said, you go to that upper room until you be endued with power. He's wanting to fill you with his power. He's wanting to fill you with that sweet spirit that you feel. And there is such a beautiful presence here. As the ushers come to receive the tithe and the offering, I ask you to go to prayer for Sister Bobby Lopez's friend. Brother Fidel was reminding me. I'm not on Facebook very often. Sometimes hear about it. But Sister Bobby's been asking continued prayer for a friend of her, Lindsay. For her husband who's been very ill seriously ill at this point and she just found out that she also has cancer now has young children let's just pray God would do a miracle in this situation he knows exactly what needs to happen for his name to be exalted to be lifted up higher I'm sure there's other needs in this building let's just take them to God this evening together Lord we thank you for your goodness to us thank you for being the wonderful God who does everything and you do it exceedingly well I ask you to speak faith into the Lopez's that they could be ministers of your righteousness ministers of faith ministers of salvation and healing to this family to Lindsay and to her husband we ask ask you to work a miracle on their behalf that your name would be glorified we'll testify of it I ask you to bless every other need that's represented in this congregation we'll give you praise for it ask your blessings upon this tithe and offering as we give it back to you with praise in Jesus name amen
this evening, ask your name to be glorified in our midst. You know, these services have been building once upon another. Pastors have been doing a wonderful job. The teaching's been going together. Bishop got into the act, was teaching, and they, they're just growing upon one another. We have service this evening. Tomorrow night we have a break, and then Friday night we come right back into revival services that we've been gearing up towards spiritually anticipating for a long, long time. I'm looking for wonderful things to end up happening this weekend. How many of you recall a minister, I can't even think of the name right now, who stood up here and asked you, if God puts somebody in your mind right now, start praying for them, that God will start working on them. Do you remember being asked that? That person who came to your mind right then, now is the perfect time to invite them to service Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Believing God is going to do something. He's put them on your heart. You've been watering them in prayer. Let's see what God will do. Amen. I want a chance to thank you all. I'm sure the rest of the pastors feel the same. There's just much not time and not much time in services to thank you for a wonderful pastor appreciation what you did last night for Elder State and all the ministers thank you so much for the time the effort the finances you put into that and then Christmas practice for all of our youngsters 11 and under as soon as we dismiss here they're going to head over to the annex get ready for that and I want to thank Brother Lashley Brother Tysinger all the men who helped with the sewer on Sunday let's give them a big round of applause texted out a picture of what, what big old root clog that they got out of there. He said they came down later in the week and tore up a section of the grounds and laid new sewer tile down there. So thank them so much for taking care of the house. we got little things end up happening. Take time to appreciate one another. Fellowship together. You're welcome to meet me Tuesday morning at Carl's Bakery. I will be done with my, I have biometrics happening on Monday afternoon. So my fast is over then, or not fast, my diet's over. Tuesday morning at Carl's Bakery. Lord bless you. Fellowship, we'll have the word here in a moment.
Well, praise God, everybody. Let's just do this, okay? All right, let's not. Uh, no, let's let's have revival. Let's have harvest. Let, come on, God's promised us a thousand. So let's just do this. Amen. Uh, are you ready? I hope you are because God's doing some incredible things. Amen. I, I'm excited what's transpiring. Um, it's been a crazy year of change, and it's not over yet. Uh, how many of you want harvest and revival? Then I hope you meant that. Because in order for things to change, things got to change. What's the first sign of insanity? Keep doing the same thing you've been doing. Expect different results. So are y'all ready to, are y'all willing to change? <laughs> Maybe you're not ready to change, but are you willing to change? Oh, praise God. Amen. I'll be talking to you about some things that um, fill in the Holy Ghost directions. You know, I uh, went to a minister's uh, meeting the other night uh, for Section 9 Fellowship, and Brother Mitchell from Columbus, Indiana uh, one of the mentors in my life was there. He was speaking, and uh, was it? Yeah. He either said or quoted someone that said, "If you have not uh, changed something within your church in the last was it year or two years, if you not had not a major change, go home and do it. Go home and do it because we get caught in a rut." And uh, we, we need change. Uh, we're going to be changed until we're called home. And, uh, and we could say, oh, I'm spiritually changing. <laughs> Isn't that so ambiguous? You can't say, yeah, I'm changing. I can't see that. Neither can the lost. No, neither can our world. But um, when God begins to change on the inside, we begin to change on the outside. And God's definitely done some changing on me this year. And uh, I know he's working on you as well. If you have your, uh, if you have that handout, I, I hope that I made enough. If not, gentlemen, go back there and run somewhere off. Um, you could catch up really quick unless you want to take notes on a review that I'm going to do rather quickly. We're talking about the DNA of revival, and uh, this is important to get down. These are the nuts and bolts. This is like a uh, any. Uh, you ever seen a mixing board on on the sound system? Anybody ever seen one? It's got all these different knobs and all these different. How about an equalizer on your stereo? Maybe you've seen that. And you've got to balance everything out. Uh, that's what this is. This is a balancer that balances the church of God out. And all of these, uh, all of these little uh, plans and all these little steps that we talk about are, are so to speak, the, the knobs and the levers and the slides on, on that equalizer. And it's all to bring about a harmony in the church that produces revival and harvest. And uh, we've been studying for too long uh, consecration. Now, I, I, don't, I say that tongue-in-cheek because I don't think you can study it too much. Now, y'all are going to have to forgive me. Every once in a while, I forget that my neck is killing me, and I turn my head in such a way it makes my eyes cross. You ever done that? Gone to sleep? Everything was fine and woke up, and you feel like you got a two-by-four for a neck? That's kind of the way I am right now, and uh, it reminds me. Um, anyway, in efforts to facilitate the revival and harvest that God is going to send Peoria Metro, he's going to do it. He said, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh, and God's promised us a piece of that revival. He really has. I, I would love to see P.O.P. a thousand strong in a mother church and then several daughter works of a thousand. How about you? Oh, that, that's impossible, isn't it? No, uh-uh. No, listen, folks, I went to Hawaii. Not the time y'all sent me. That one was awesome. Um, I went to Hawaii under, I'm going to say, my brother and I, went to Hawaii under less than ideal circumstances. Let me just put it that way. 
Um, I'm just going to say this in passing. I saw things there that I shouldn't have seen out of ministry. And I, I really regretted that for a long time. Sister Hamilton, there was times that it bothered me what I had seen, the, the failures and the, the, the hurts, and I forgot the good. And I asked Bishop, I asked God, I remember uh, it wasn't too long ago, maybe a couple, three, four years ago, I think I went, what did we go, in 2000, 2001? Just a few years ago, I think it was, I asked God, God, why did I go through that? And God reminded me of the good that I saw. And the good was this. We were there seven days. Seven days, and over 70 people received the baptism of the Holy Ghost in, 70, in seven days. Wouldn't that be incredible to a church of about 35? That'd be like you, and it happened in a week. That'd be like you coming to church on Sunday getting the hiccups and missing the rest of the week and come back next Sunday and this church run about 500. That's impossible, isn't it? With men, yeah, but not with God. And we just saw it happen. And that was under, and I said that was under less than ideal circumstances. It was just time. Everything was right. The people were right. The pastor was right. God was ready to move. And God used faulty vessels to do a, a heavenly, holy work. Now, if God, I, I said, God, why, did, why, did, why was I exposed to that? God said, for the good stuff, Jeff. Can you put the bad stuff behind you and just remember what I did in seven days? Now, look, if God can do that in Hawaii, oh, my God. You have never seen such a culture. You think... American uh, mainland culture is crazy. You go to Ho no, don't go to Hawaii. <laughs> Bishop did me a favor. A few months later, the pastor's son developed leukemia, and he called here and asked Bishop if I could come there and pastor the work on Maui. Three years later, Bishop told me he declined for me. My daughters still haven't forgiven their mida. <laughs> but I have. I can't imagine trying to raise three daughters on Maui. Oh, my God. It's crazy. But if God can do that there, what can God do in the heart of America, in the heart of Illinois, where hearts already have an understanding of God and a desire for truth? There they're steeped in idolatry and witchcraft. What can God do? So we, God has promised an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. I don't know when he's coming back, but I know that before he comes back, there's going to be a revival that sweeps the land. I believe it with all my heart. You can say America's bad, America's turned her back on God. I will agree wholeheartedly. But in the midst of the darkness, the light shines the brightest, and there is a group of people that are hungry for truth. Come on, Ephesus, they stood and said, great is Diana for hours and hours and hours. And in the heart of Ephesus grew one of the largest church of the New Testament. Come on, don't tell me God can't have a revival in the, in the middle of a backslidden country. There's enough people that are hungry for truth, that are desiring righteousness. All we got to do is just let our light shine. Amen. So in efforts to facilitate the revival harvest that God's going to send Peoria Metro, we've embarked on a study that, and if you don't know this, if you don't remember this, this has come from Brother Kleindienst. Whenever he was here in last uh, January, he left this with me. And uh, once it's established, we'll refer to it kind of like a, a master balanced until God calls us home. We'll come back to this periodically and figure out, oh, the gain needs a little more. We need a little more base over here or whatever. You understand what I'm saying. The mantra of the church is to do the will of God in the earth. That's why we're here. The mantra of the church, the purpose of the church the song of the church is to do the will of God on the earth. And since we are his ambassadors slash uh, fellow laborers, it's vital to the cause that we maintain our spirit and our mission. I said our spirit and our mission. Because I can maintain my spirit and forget the mission. 
I said, I can maintain my spirit and be holy and forget why I'm holy. Or vice versa. I can remember the mission and burn myself out on the mission and forget to strengthen my spirit. So it is, it's, it's a balance that we walk. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. This is the greatest commandment. This is the purpose of, of humanity in the, in the earth, to love God. First and foremost, the first thing that we're supposed to do is love God with all. That, that's it. And then he, he, he went on to qualify later on in John chapter 14. If you love me, here's how I'm going to know that. You'll keep my commandments. Now, he said, others will know that you're my disciples because you have love for one another. But he said, I'll know that you love me because you keep my commandments. And then he goes on in verse 16. That's John chapter 14 and 15. It says, and I. Everyone say, and I. Yeah. That's a connection to the previous verse. If you look it up in, in, in your concordance, it'll say a conjunction or in regards to. And I, if you love me, keep my commandments. As a result, I will pray to the Father, and he'll give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. So in order for us to be empowered by God, in order for us to receive that power, we've got to love God and prove it by keeping his commandments. That's what all of this first session that I've been teaching is on, uh, is consecration. It's giving up of ourself and giving ourself to God. It's consecration. And then the second purpose for the, for the Christian, I've said this before, Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's half of it. Everyone say that's half of it. Getting new converts in the church is just the beginning. Go ye therefore and preach the gospel and baptize them. That gets them born again. But there's another part. It says teaching them to observe. Everyone say all things. Well, who's supposed to teach them? The disciples of Christ make other disciples and we teach them. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. So teach them. So our first goal is to love God with everything we've got and then utilize the power that comes from loving God, the power of the Holy Ghost, Acts chapter 1 and 8, that works through a submitted vessel to God that disciples others in this glorious doctrine and lifestyle of Christ. Can I just stop here as a pastor and say, you know what the difference? I had an individual come to me some time back. Uh, it's been a few years ago. And they were bent on me relaxing some of the holiness standards of POP. First they came nice. Then they came suggestive. Then they came adamant. You will do this. I said, why do you come to POP? Well, I love what I feel in this place. I said, you feel it anywhere else? No. I said, do you know why you feel it here? Because we have separated ourselves to be holy before God. And because we've separated ourselves unto God, to the extent you are separate unto God, you're anointed by God. So you want me to do away with what causes the anointing. So if I succumb to what you're saying and I begin to practice what you're saying, you won't want to come to POP. After that conversation, they didn't want to come to POP anyway. But we have to have a revelation and we have to teach not just the doctrine of Christ, but the lifestyle of Christ. These studies that we've been doing are, sequ are sequential in that they build upon one another. We're studying Revelation beginning this evening, and I'm going to try to go through the whole study of Revelation. So buckle your seatbelt. I want you to realize that just because I study how to re receive Revelation doesn't mean that I acquire it. You don't give what is precious 
to something or someone who don't or won't know how to appreciate it. Jesus said you don't cast pearls before swine. And I'm not calling anybody a pig tonight, okay? But I'm just simply asking, why give revelation to one who won't accept it and apply it? I found that as soon as I obey the revelation that's been given to me, Brother Mounts, he gives me another one. But it's a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's not a halogen beam that lights up the interstate. One step at a time. One step at a time. So the more Jesus decides to reveal himself, the more he narrows the crowd. Wouldn't it have been incredible if he had just told the whole world that I'm the Son of God? I'm the Christ. He did eventually. That's what got him crucified. But when he asked Peter, he said, whom do men say that I am? He had a small crowd there that day, Brother Ray. It was the disciples. And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He said, hey, shut up. Hush. He said, flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And then he said, boop. Mount of Transfiguration. He didn't even take the 12 disciples up there. Three. So when Jesus begins to reveal himself, he begins to narrow the crowd to those that are the most committed to him. When God begins to show revelation... He doesn't show revelation to everybody. That's why you come to the house of God and the men of God can preach a revelatory message and you can be on the end, edge of your seat going, oh my God, wow. And the person beside you go, what's that all about? It's those that are hungry for God, he begins to reveal himself to. We prove our love and our adoration and our desire for revelation through this first step called consecration. Consecration is to be holy. It's to be set apart from the ungodly, yes, but also to the godly. The the psalmist said, the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. It's, It's so important, yes, to separate ourselves from sin. It's vital. It, it's, it, it's, a man, it's mandatory. But just as important as putting off the old man with his works is to put on the new man and his works. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. Uh, where is she? Sister uh, Tara Chappie here tonight. I've got her little thing she was asking for. Anyway. This verse is in it. She was asking me for a verse of scripture. Ephesians 2 and 10. We are, everyone say his. His His workmanship. And you and I were created in Christ Jesus for a reason. Not for salvation, but good works. For a ministry. God created you and I, every last one of us, with a ministry in mind. For good works, which God prepared beforehand. God already designed it. Brother Mike, God's already got a ministry ready for you to step right into it. The scripture says that we, everyone say, should. Didn't say would. It said we should walk in them. How does that happen? Through consecration. You know, I'm not walking in all the ministry God wants me to yet. But I'm getting there. Neither are you. None of us have made it yet. But we're getting there. Consecration. The key word, I'm going to do a quick review here, is separation. Mount Sinai, or the word, the law that was given, was what separated Israel from Egypt. They came out of Egypt. They, they were baptized uh, to Moses through the, through the uh, water and through the cloud. And they came on. And the first place they went was Mount Sinai. And that's where God gave them the law. And the law was what was between them and slavery from that point on. When they broke the law, they fell into slavery. But when they adopted the law, God brought them out. 
As long as they would submit to the law, they were free from slavery. But as humans, we must be submitted to a higher authority. We have to be. So the first step of consecration was to seek. Jeremiah 23 and 19, if you don't have your notes from, oh, my Lord, I don't know when we started this. You can write on the back of the ones you got. Seek, Jeremiah 29 and 13, and you will seek me and find me when you love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's basically what it says here. When you search for me with all your heart. Now, I, I'm just going to go through this because I don't have time to stop here. I've done it for oh, months. To serve, the second key word. Don't you know that whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slaves to whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience under righteousness. Whenever we commit ourselves, we commit ourselves to either serve God, and we say, oh, I'm serving myself. No. No. Man was created, remember, a little lower than the angels. And so you are either going to serve heaven or you're going to serve a lower deity, but you're going to serve. And I've said many times, your flesh has uh, become confederate with Satan. Our carnal's flesh and the enemy work hand in hand against us. And then the third one is submit. Ah, I spent I don't know how long on that one. Why? Because it rankles just to say the word, doesn't it? Or maybe to hear the word. Amos 3 and 3. Can two walk together? Unless they're agreed. Somebody's got to submit to the other one's direction. Somebody's got to submit to the other one's way. Somebody's got to submit to walk with an authority. So to be, con to be uh, consecrated got to be submitted because his ways are above my ways I've always said when I want to find the will of God I have to find out what I want to do and just do the opposite usually that usually that's brother Mounts that just usually works perfect for me pastor you shouldn't be so obstinate how come y'all are so quiet Yeah, this consecration thing ain't fun, is it? <laughs> Sacrifice. Now, folks, this is revival. This is the foundation of revival. These words that I've just spoken to you, seeking God first and foremost, serving God and one another foremost, submitting to God, and not just God. Remember, submit yourself one to the other. Let's just scream and shout and praise God over that one right there. Sacrifice. I've got to be willing to sacrifice if I'm going to have harvest and revival. I've got to be willing to sacrifice first and foremost my ideas and my will and my way. Brother Mitchell said the other day something about, uh, he said, when people say, my ministry. <laughs> he said, I look at him and say, yeah, what did you do? To create that ministry. Just what about you brought this ministry to, to this place? Just what is it about you that deserves this ministry? It's not our ministry. It's God's ministry. So sacrifice, sacrifice is most of the time what I want to do because my flesh is in cahoots with the enemy. Everybody say amen. amen. Your greatest enemy is not Satan. Satan, in fact, a legion of demons could not keep one man from coming and falling at the feet of Jesus and getting delivered and becoming a disciple and disciple maker. Because when they came back, the whole cities, the whole area turned out to, to see Christ. The king said to Aruna, no, David, when he came to the threshing floor, I'll buy it from you at a price. I won't offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. He wasn't giving God leftovers. He wasn't giving God something that was just, uh, you know, casual. This cost. 
So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built an altar there and watch this to the Lord and offered burnt sacrifice and offerings and peace offerings. And the Lord, no, let me back up. So the Lord heeded the prayers for the land and the plague was withdrawn from Israel as a result of sacrifice. Bishop, I believe that if David would have took Aruna up on his offer, Jerusalem would have been wiped out. There had to be a sacrifice. And there had to come, it had to come from the priest. Listen, priest of your homes, offer up that sacrifice to God. Suffering. Yes, 2 Timothy 3.12. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. What an advertisement campaign. But if you just hang on a little bit, he said, if we suffer with him, you're going to reign with him. It's worth it. I said, it's worth it. The things that we have to give up for revival, when you see people walking through the doors and receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost, with Paul, you'll say, that's nothing. What, what I gave up was absolutely nothing to win Christ and to win this move of God. The above areas of consecration are to remove flesh and carnal factors. Everybody realize you have an edemic nature that's at opposition with the Lord and God's will for your life. You realize that. Well, consecration is to remove that edemic nature. It's to remove that self and that flesh factor in the equation. Everything we've studied is anathema. Everything I just said is anathema to our self-seeking and self-preservation natural mindset. When I start talking about stuff like this, something on the inside of me starts justifying, screaming, running, hiding. That's self-preservation, and we all have it. That's why Paul said, I have to die daily because there's something on the inside of me that just wants to live. But for me to live is Christ, he said. So consecration, the, here's why. There's a reason that this has to happen in this progression. There's a reason why I have to be consecrated, Brother Clousing, before I can have revelation. 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him, nor can he know them. Why? Because they're spiritually discerned. I have to become consecrated to God. I have to die out to my flesh, to this carnal nature, in order to be alive to the Spirit. In order for me to have revelation from God, I have to have, turn a blind eye to the natural things of the flesh. So consecration gives birth to revelation. Because as we get nearer and nearer to him, he begins to reveal more and more of his truths. Everybody wanted to know who was going to betray Christ. But not one of them dared ask him. Except John. And Peter knew if anybody could get it out of him, John could. John had a special relationship with Jesus. He said, I don't, I don't get it. You, he had a love for Jesus that the others realized, and I think they may have excused because he was the youngest. But the Bible said, the one who leaned on the breast of Jesus. I love my dad. I'm his son. This is kind of weird. John didn't think it was. Not him. And Peter, when everybody wanted to know who it was, Peter leaned over to John. And he said, hey, ask him. 
He'll tell any of us. He'll tell. Why? Because John had that complete love for God. In fact, when all the disciples ran from him, John stuck around. Revelation. I want, to, I want knowledge of the holy. I don't want it just to be smart. I want it to fulfill his will. With Paul, I pray, oh, that I might know him. And the power, and I realize it comes after the suffering, but I still want to know him. How about you? I said, how about you? How many of you are ready to count a cost for revival and harvest? Because it's going to cost. I said it's going to (laughs) cost. But look, there's a power in revelation when it's given to a spiritual and submitted mind. Jesus said this, if you'll abide in me. And the only way that you can walk with God is if you agree together and if you're submitted with him. He said, and my words abide in you. Watch this. You can ask whatever you desire. Because if you're walking with me and my word's abiding in you, when you ask, you're not going to ask amiss. You're not going to ask for yourself. You're going to ask, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. God, open up the windows of heaven. God, pour out your blessings upon Peoria. God, save the lost. God, save my neighbor. God, let your will be done. Flow, Holy Ghost. He said, it'll be done. Sister Nona Freeman quoted Romans chapter 10, verse 17, a little differently than we do. She quoted it like this, faith cometh by, and we would say hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Sister Freeman quoted it like this, faith comes by revelation, and revelation by the word of God. Faith just doesn't come, faith doesn't come just by hearing the word of God. If that was the case, the altars would be full and we'd be turning Peoria upside down. It's by having the word reveal with a depth of understanding that divines and activates faith. The Bible warns you and I to be doers of the word and not just hearers of the word. Because if we do that, we deceive ourselves. When we receive doctrinal truths, lifestyle instructions, and relational insights directly from the Lord through His Word by revelation, our lives begin to change as we walk in the light. It's so important that we have a spirit of revelation in the church. It's so important that there is a people that are consecrated to do whatever God asks, whenever God asks, and however God asks, so that This begins to operate in the church, and there is a spirit of revelation. It's contagious. When there's people that are hungry for the Word of God, it influences the next person to be hungry for the Word of God because they see the Word of God changing us. They say, I want that change in my life, and they realize the only way change comes is by consecration to this revelation. It's so important that we have a spirit of revelation in our church and in our individual lives so that we can become changed more and more into his image. I, I'm not there yet, Brother Ritzy. I, I want to be. I haven't been changed enough, Sister Kathy. I want him to continue to change me. And if I want that to happen, then, Brother Mounts, I've got to have more revelation. And the more revelation I get, the more consecrated to that revelation I've got to be. Because how many of you have understood this? Change isn't always fun. I love the results, but I hate the diet. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16, Paul says, I do not... Cease giving thanks for you, making mentions of you always in my prayers. Wow, that's Im- wouldn't it be awesome to have the Apostle Paul praying for you? Well, what's he praying? That God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Paul, I want blessings. 
What about he loads us daily with blessings? The blessings will overtake me in the city. Blessings will overtake me in the streets and in the country. What about the blessings? Let me tell you what, the will of God is the greatest blessing you'll ever have in your life. I said, I'm telling you, the will of God operating, the ministry of God operating you through you. Demonstration is the next, uh, the, the next one. It comes after revelation. But the demonstration of the revelation that happens because of consecration is the greatest, uh, the most wonderful miracle and fulfillment you'll ever have in your life. He said, I'm praying that God give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. Oh my God, open our eyes. The enemy has so blinded our eyes uh, with the distractions uh, and the distortions uh, of this world. Uh, He said, I'm praying that the knowledge of God, the power of God, the hope of the ministry and the calling of you. He said, well, enlighten your eyes that you may know what the hope of his calling is, what the riches and glory of the inheritance of the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us. It's not God's will that we just barely make it into heaven, that we struggle every day in our Christian walk, but it's the exceeding greatness of his power that the Apostle Paul said, I want you to experience that. I want God to open your eyes and your understanding so you can see yourself doing this. The definition of revelation is making known of something that was previously secret or unknown in a dramatic or surprising manner. Revelation. When God told me Saturday night, I said, God, if I just knew your will, I'd do it. He said, no, you wouldn't. I always thought I would. He said, you wouldn't because you can't. In order to do my will, you have to be spiritually empowered. And just to know my will isn't enough. You have to be empowered to accomplish that will. That was revelation to me. Well, pastor, that's so simple. It led me to deeper consecration. It led me to a deeper place of commitment. Because I want to be empowered to do the will of God. I already do the will of God, but I want to do more of it. Brother Franklin Howard's coming. I can't wait. He was one of them standing right here that took my hands and began to prophesy. And these hands said, these hands, through these hands, God will heal. I don't know if you remember that, Bishop, but I never forgot it. Not me. Christ in me. Jesus said, if you don't believe me for my words, then believe me for my works. Signs, miracles, wonders are going to be the things that validate the church in this last day. So they listen to what you say about doctrine and about the the power of the Holy Ghost to transform their life. Let me tell you what. They've heard of salvation every which way you can imagine. I'd be an atheist myself, I believe, if I didn't know the power, the true power of the Holy Ghost. Because everybody that calls themselves Christian are not. Everybody says they, they walk in the power of the Holy Ghost. If that's the Holy Ghost, I don't want nothing to do with it. I'm not saying everybody, but I just said everybody that says that. They need to see there's a difference, not a Benny Hinn difference, nothing fake, nothing phony. God's already given us a taste of that. God's amazing how he does some stuff, Andrew. I'd like for him to do it in a big, grandiose way. But when he came to the earth, he went to a stable. was called to go to pray for a guy. He was hospice had already been there. He was going to die that night. Everything was failing, kidneys, uh, all the the organs were shutting down. And this lady who rarely ever comes to our church, I I pray God help her. She called me. She said, my dad's dying. Will you go pray for my dad? I said, okay. What's his name? Who is he? Where is he? She told me, she said, he's going to die tonight, and I just want you to go pray that God's peace will be upon him and mercies of God will be extended to him. 
I said, he's a believer? She said, no. Wow. Boy, that puts you in a rock and a hard place. I said, okay. I said, I'll be there in an hour. I was there and nobody else was. Walked into the room. I thought, nobody else cares. What am I doing here? So I thought, well, I said I'd pray for the men. And so I did. I walked over. Sister Alexis, I, I started to pray that the peace of God would be upon him and the family and this man's passing. And Now, God doesn't speak to me audibly, so when I say God spoke to me, please understand, it's just the thought goes through my mind. The thought went through my mind, what if I want to heal him? I'm not spiritual enough, okay? Please forgive me, because I said, why? To what end? For what purpose? Old, got off the boat with Noah, old. Never wanted anything to do with church, God. Bishop, I, I said, but <laughs> I learned a long time ago, don't argue with God. And the cool thing, Brother Matt, nobody was in the room, so I wasn't going to make a fool out of myself. So I kind of looked around, make sure there wasn't a nurse in the room. <laughs> I put my hand on this man, and I rebuked the spirit of death. And I said, God, it's your word. Live in Jesus' name. Lightning didn't flash, thunder didn't roll, nothing happened. I felt more stupid than when I walked in the room. And I walked out of the room, and he did too, two days later. No, Fox News wasn't there, WMBD wasn't even there. He's never, op he's never darkened the doors of this church. I said, God, Why? I felt like Jonah, Bishop. Didn't I tell you? <laughs> God said, so you would know. And you'd have faith to step out when it was time. I've had that happen at least twice. I've been a minister since I was 25, 24, 25. So two times in 25 years? No, I, I want to see it happen continually. Like I said, I'm not where I want to be in God. I, I don't believe I'm where God wants me to be in ministry. But he showed me some things. He revealed to me the greatness, the exceeding greatness of his power. That's the power I want to walk in on a continuous basis. Revelation is based on the Word of God. Everybody understand that. It's not a feeling. You'll get in trouble trusting your feelings. Three, the three F's. Fact. The Word of God is the fact. You put your faith in the Word of God. And then your feelings will follow. Don't you get any of the three mixed up. There are those that have faith above fact. We've got an Islamic issue going on. Or God forbid we put our feelings first. His word is forever settled. Everyone say forever settled. Forever. What is? The word of God. It's a lamp unto our feet. It's his word, and his word is life. It's our life. This is where we learn of him in Revelation. We've divested ourselves of self, carnality, and consecration, and now we've come to the place of revelation, and revelation, this revelation phase, is acquisition of knowledge and or the skills through being taught or the experiences we have or practice and study. I would like to say all the above. The key word of revelation here, here, before anything can happen, you got to hear the word of God. 
Ezekiel was in a valley full of dry bones. He said, hear you the word of the Lord. I don't care if you're dead in your spirit. If you'll turn an ear to the word of God, he'll revive your spirit. He'll revive your soul. I don't care if your dreams are dead, your ministry's dead, your faith is dead. If you'll just begin to hear the word of God, he'll speak revelation and he will revive your spirit through the revelation of the word. Hear. Luke chapter 8 and 18, Jesus has just talked about all the, uh, the types of soil. Everybody remember a soil, sower went out to sow, uh, and he, he sowed upon the, the wayside. He sowed uh, upon the stony ground. He sowed upon the thorny ground. And then, of course, he sowed upon the good ground. And when you get all the way down to the end in Luke chapter 8 and verse 18, he says, therefore, take heed. What's that next word? Wow. Not What? We read several times, Brother Jeff Ray, that he that hath ears, let him hear what the Spirit would say to the church. Here, Jesus is saying, if you want to bear fruit, depending on how much fruit you want to bear, it depends upon how you hear the Word of God. With what attitude I receive the Word of God. What my spirit is when I receive the Word of God. Take heed. Everyone say, How? Don't be hard in your spirit. Don't let stony areas not give room to God. Don't allow other issues to crowd out the word of God. But be good ground, receptive to receive the word of God. And it will bring forth multiple multitudes in your life. One of the greatest concerns of a pastor is how the church or individual receives the word of God. We want to preach it. We want to teach it in such a way where the Word of God is the authority. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. If it's in here, that's the Word of God. It's absolute. Remember, it is forever settled. However, we want to present the truth in love. We don't want to present it in such a way that that it becomes a... a, I I don't want to say distasteful because sometimes it is. We don't want to present it. Well, let me just back up and say how we do. We want to adorn the gospel. And the greatest fear is sometimes you can't get around the fact that a knife is a knife is a knife is a knife. And the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. And it does pierce and it does cut. The word of God is an agent of change. Revelation is an agent of change. Something's revealed to me because I don't know it. Agreed? Well, if I don't know it and it's the word of God, then I have to not just accept it, but I have to apply it. And we're all for it until it starts on our own pet issues. Until God tells Jeffrey several years ago, lay down the bow. God, it's not a sin. No, I know it's not. God, there's nothing wrong with it. It's not immoral. No, it's just taking up too much of your time. It's only taking up one one day a week, Saturday. Not even the whole Saturday. About three hours in the morning, I go shoot a tournament. It was just relaxing. But I was so devoted to it, Brother Ray, every morning before work. I go out there and stare at the target. I get one shot. Didn't know the yardage. I just walk out in the yard, see the target. I have to guesstimate the yardage. Have to gap my pins. And I have to make that perfect shot. Because you only get one shot at the trophy of a lifetime. You don't, have, you don't get to say, wait, I get another one. You don't get a mulligan. And so every morning, I give 10, 15 minutes to being good on Saturday. God said, when was the last time you gave me 10, 15 minutes every morning so you could be awesome on Sunday? This is before I was preaching, before I was pastoring. So the word of God began to cut at my little pet issue. It wasn't even a sin. It was just a wait. Okay, I'll, I'll leave that. Here, here's the fear of a pastor. And 
watch it happen. Paul loved the church of Galatia. He said, at one time, when I brought you salvation, you'd have plucked out your eyes and gave them to me if it was possible. But now when it comes to your sanctification, do you count me an enemy because I tell you the truth? We're so, we're so much enamored with God whenever he gives us salvation and saves us from our sin. But when he tries to start changing us for his glory, for his work, oh, we're a little resistant. That's, that's the concern of a pastor that when we begin to preach the truth like this, you can say, wait, yeah, wait just a minute. Jesus said it this way in John chapter 15 and 3. You're already clean because of the word. The word is supposed to clean us up. The word is supposed to take stuff out of our spirit. The word is supposed to change our attitude. The word is what transforms us into this, from this edemic nature into that divine nature that Paul tells us or Peter tells us what we're partakers of. The truth is the word is unchanging despite my preferences or arguments. And we have a choice at that moment of revelation to rebel or change. And this is every pastor's concern because it's not against me. It's against the word of God and it's against our future. Because God won't ask you to change to remove your future. He only asks you to change to better your future. And when I say no, I'm saying no to my future. I'm saying no to the future of the church because I'm a minister in this church. Brother Duhan, you're a minister in this church. This church depends upon your ministry. Remember, we are ministers one to another. And God put us in the church as he saw fit because, Sister Sarah, you've got a ministry that I'm going to need somewhere. And I need you, and I need you, and I need you, and I need you. I need all of us, and we all need one another to submit ourselves to God so that we can operate fully in our ministries. We live by, everyone say, every word. Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It's our daily bread. It's our sustenance. Uh, not every good thing for me tastes good. Not every good thing tastes like ding-dongs and ho-hos. Calvin and Hobbes, one of my favorite cartoons. He said, Dad, how come every time you tell me that what I'm eating is going to build character, I know it's going to taste awful. kind of way I feel sometimes, but I realize that it's for my good. It's for my good. John said it was sweet to my mouth, but bitter to my belly, but it was for the good of the church. 2 Timothy 3.16, everyone say, all Scripture. All Scripture is given. It's in by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine. Oh, I want knowledge of God. Ah, wait a minute. For reproof. When you read the word of God, if it don't reprove you, you're not reading it right. That's what it's for. The day it quits reproving you is the day you better fall on your knees and ask God to open the eyes of your understanding. For correction. And instruction in righteousness. Now I'm hurrying. How we hear determines how much effort or the seed or the word has in our lives. How much effect. The attitude in which we receive revelation. It, it concerns me. It doesn't happen all the time. Sometimes it's a blessing. Sometimes it's a curse. My daughter thinks it's always a curse. Sometimes God will reveal things to me. And Andrew, the thing that bothers me the most is when I talk to people 
They're more concerned about who I heard it from, where I heard it from, how I knew about it, than what it was. Who told you? Does it matter? Is it true or is it not? And if it is, do we need to fix it? I love you anyway. I don't care. It's not between you and me and God. It's between you and God. I'm just trying to help you get there. I'm not going to give you a spanking. You ain't my kids. You're God's kids. Life will spank you enough. Okay, we got to hurry here because I'm going to give you some scriptures to go home and read. Here, in your notes, Amos 8 and 11. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not of bread, not of the word. There'll come a famine of, everyone say hearing. God, don't let it happen to me. With Brother Arnold, I pray, every time I pray, Bishop, God, don't let me be deceived. Don't let me be deceived. Let me, don't let me hear what I want and the things that I want and let it crowd out your voice. That, that still, small voice, God, speak to me. Let me hear. But hearing the words of the Lord. So hearing. Be careful when you shut out that still, small voice. Number two, receive. You've got to, when you've heard revelation... You've got to receive it. Don't do any good if you tell me about it if I just don't receive it. For the re- this reason, 1 Thessalonians 2.13, you can write this down. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing because when you received, everyone say the word of God. You received the word of God which you heard from us. You received it not as the words of men. That's also the fear of a minister. When we preach the anointed word of God, we've prayed, we've studied, we've fasted, we've laid before God. God put this in our heart. You walk to the pulpit and they're like, yeah. That's your interpretation. I'm not saying this church. I'm saying we have to guard against that. We have to guard against. You don't receive the word of God as a word of man, but as truth. Come on. If it's in the book, let's do it. If it's in the book, let's not argue about it. Let's just do it. Now, if it's not in the book, come talk to me, and we can negotiate. I've learned from my father. I am a benevolent dictator. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's the word of truth, the word of God, which effectively works in you who believe. Come on, if I receive the word of God, I don't care who it comes from. Balaam got it from a donkey and it worked. If you'll believe it, it'll affect, everyone say effectively. It'll effectively work in you. And then if you'll abide, don't just receive it, but keep it alive. Paul told Timothy, stir up the gift that was given to you by the laying on of hands. When was the last time you stirred up a revelation that God gave you? When was the last time you went back and you put it in your mind and you begin to pray it into existence? If you abide in me and let this revelation abide in your mind and abide in your spirit and abide in, a, in your life until it works its way out, you can begin to see the power of God at work. Everyone say love. love. Oh, you got to have a love for the word of God. I said you got to have a love for the word of God. I made God a vow I don't know, years and years ago that I would read at least five chapters a day in the Word of God. Isn't that noble? That was before I became a pastor. You know, Brother Lashley, I have not, I had not visited that vow until lately. Revisited, I guess. I always did, at least. More. I want to say 99.99999% of the time. But God started talking to me about spending more time in his word. So I told him, I said, God, I don't know that I can vow this, but I will tell you that to the best of my ability, I'll begin to spend an hour a day not studying, not looking for a sermon, 
just reading your word. Not praying it, just reading it, submersing my mind in the word of God. I want to tell you, something is happening. On I told my wife, I said, I can't explain. I can't tell you what it is. I can't tell you what area it is. I just feel something different about me. Brother Ritzy, I don't do it every day, but I do it most days. There's some days, that, Sunday, I'm studying, praying, asking God for miracle signs and wonders. I ain't reading no hour in the Word of God. But I've noticed, Brother Lashley, something is like God scooping out some depths. A love for the Word of God. Now, here's why it's important. Here's why it's important to have a love for God. Because there's coming a lawless one according to the works of Satan, and he's going to deceive, cause deception among those who perish. And here's why they're going to perish. Because they did not have a love for truth. Truth is the Word of God. Truth is revelation. Every once in a while, I tell my wife, I like you. It's important. She knows I like her or I love her. But it's nice every once in a while to hear, hear me say, hey, I like you a whole bunch. I don't always like what I read in the Word of God. But I love the Word of God. This edemic nature on the inside of me sometimes recoils. At the word of God. Now I'm closing. I promise I got one more. Because the time will come when they won't endure sound doctrine. But will according to their own devices, their own desires, because they have, everyone say, itchy ears. I don't want to hear that. I want, you to, I want you to say this. They will heap up for themselves teachers and they'll turn away from their ears from the truth and be turned aside into untruth or fables. But if you and I will get a love for truth, a love for revelation, and abide in that revelation, finally speak. That's the last word. Acts 4 and 31, when they had prayed in a place where they were assembled together was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They spoke the word of God with boldness. They were committed. They had already been to jail and been beaten for it. They were excited about what God was doing. Oh, they hadn't been beaten yet. I take that back. They had been threatened. The beating came next. But as a result, 5,000 people were added to the church. Would you take a beating for 5,000 converts? Oh, boy, that's good. Would you sacrifice for them? Would you deny yourself for them? Would you accept revelation, whatever God reveals to you to change? Would you do that for him? I did it, folks. I got all the way through revelation. Next week, we're going to talk about demonstration. Stand with me. Thank you, God, for this word. It's a lamp unto our feet. It is the light into our path. And, God, if we'll let that light shine, we'll walk in truth, we'll walk in dominion, and we'll walk in power. God, be with your people. Open our eyes and our hearts and seal this word in our spirit, we pray. And everyone said, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.